Hello, Nuggets. Uh, so I said I was going to do some posts on Alzheimer's, some blogs on Alzheimer's, and uh, I've been trying to think what stories I want to tell, what the perspective is, because I'm not just going to tell you crappy stories or stories that don't have any context. So I think the point that just occurred to me is that in a bizarre <laughs> spiritual way, my mother's Alzheimer's is almost like the last parenting she did for me it's the last gift she gave me because I have grown up so much since my mother got Alzheimer's it's completely changed me and there were certain things that happened during her disease that are moments that I failed at that I look back on now that I failed at and that I wouldn't do again and I'm a better person because of the awful experience my mother went through and vicariously I went through so it's actually grown me up and it feels in some ways that it was like my mother's last task she has no idea and and in a way that's a, a flippant thing to say but i really do feel that her alzheimer's improved me as a person it's changed me so i'll give you an example so i used to take her out every sunday and with alzheimer's patients you often want routine at least certainly it, it worked for us right so we would go to this place called the Agape Spiritual Church, which is in Los Angeles. It was in Culver City. I think they've moved now, but they were in Culver City because my mother loved church. She was a very spiritual person. She moved from different religions. We were Mormon for a while. We'd be Mormon, all sorts of things, right? Um, so, and I didn't know what she was into at that point, but I know that she has faith in God. She had faith in God and that she believed in some connection to a higher power. So we went to Agape because... I think it just fit and also they sing a lot and my mother was a wonderful singer she was a jazz singer for uh, in cabaret for for a long time and she had a beautiful voice and she loved to sing so I thought well let's you know music's good for outside as well so let's go to Agape so here was our routine I'd pick her up um, I'd take her out and give Fred a break my stepfather a break because he was just exhausted by the time I got there just looked exhausted and those two three hours with her um were an absolute godsend to him i think you know uh just to give him a break i don't know how much he managed to relax but it was it was a moment for him to to relax so i pick her up and we would always go to ihop that's her favorite thing if you're watching this from a different country international house of pancakes it's just a diner it's a cafe right a chain um but she got the alzheimer's gave her a very sweet tooth she always had a sweet tooth but she was, she was unfettered with her desire for sweet foods. Uh, she would just go and order pancakes every day, always pancakes. And by the time the disease was advanced enough that she couldn't remember what she would want to order, I would say, do you want pancakes? And she'd go, oh yeah, pancakes. She was always very excited about the pancakes. She loved the sweets. She was on a lot of medicines at the time as well. And probably those medicines reduced her taste buds. And so she needed extreme flavors. So, you know, maple syrup or pancake with sugar and lemon juice and all that, that's, that's going to do the trick. So we would go to IHOP. We would, uh, I'd pay up and we'd go to the car. We'd go to Agape. We'd be at Agape for two or three hours. We would sing. And then I would take her home. Sometimes we'd go somewhere else. Sometimes we would then go to, uh, there's like a spiritual gardens down in, um, or is that Pacific Palisades, like a spiritual retreat. So we do a couple of little things and then I take her home. So the story is about how one of the examples where it grew me up is that we went to IHOP and we were sitting in IHOP and my mum looked at me from across. She was eating her um, pancakes and I was talking. They were exhausting those meetings because it was always me talking. My mother couldn't really, didn't really have anything to say, couldn't connect thoughts well enough. So it was just me talking to her for four hours. It was exhausting. It would tear my throat out. But I'm talking to her and she suddenly stops eating and just looks at me and this, this look of, of concern and disturbance crossed her face. And I had no idea what it was. And I said, are you all right? And she's like, I, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm like, well, what, what do you want? Do you want to go? She's like, yeah, yeah, I want to go. So I quickly pay up and uh, I come back and I'm like, are you okay? Do you need to go to the bathroom? She's like, I don't know, because she didn't know. She didn't know when she needed to go to the bathroom. So I said, well, come on, let's get out of here. So I stood her up. And when she stood up, I noticed that she'd wet herself. And there was pee all over the, 
the bench. Uh, it wasn't a fabric bench, fortunately. It was a plastic bench, you know, plastic booth bench. And there was pee on the bench. And I had a moment, because she knew, she turned around and looked at it and then looked back at me and she was almost in tears, but she didn't know what to say. So I went, oh, it's okay, that's okay, come on, let's go to the car. And so as I walked her out to the car, I looked at the um, maitre d', what do you call that, the server, whatever, the person who sits you down, the seater, I think they call it. And I looked at the seater and she looked at me, she says, is everything okay? And in that moment, I had a decision to make, which is either I say to her, yeah, my mother made a bit of a, had an accident on your seat. Um, can you give me something to clean it up? Or I could say absolutely nothing and walk out and pretend it wasn't my problem. That's what I did. I walked out. I didn't deal with the problem in any way. I just walked out, ruined someone else's day. <laughs> either the next person who came in or the person who found it and went, fuck, I've got to clean this up. Why? What kind of person doesn't tell you? I'm the kind of person, apparently. Or I was the kind of person. And that was the old me, right? Not in everything. That's just one example. And I was under a lot of stress. And my, also my mum needed to get out. There's a ton of reasons. But none of them are really good enough not to have just said, I'm sorry, my mum had an accident. Can you help us out? You know, either will you clean it up? I'm sorry, that's a shitty job or I'll clean it up. I could have done something. I chose to do nothing. Um, and then I sat her in my car. And she got the seat wet. And um, what did I do? Where did I take her? Oh, we went to, we didn't go to the church. We went to the garden and I turned her dress around and put it at the front. Oh, such bad decisions I made. And it dried out pretty quickly. But she knew, she couldn't express, but she knew. And I think she knew that what I was doing wasn't very good. I wasn't handling that like an adult. I just, you know just didn't know what to do I didn't know I, there was no caregiver in me I really actually the first thing I thought of is my poor stepfather because it really gave me an insight into how difficult it fucking is to adjust when you don't have the tools it seems so easy when you hear the story and you watch online and you read or someone tells you that the correct response is so easy when you're not under the duress of the moment but when you're in the moment it's very easy to make bad decisions but I'm not letting myself off the hook here because what happened is Took her home. She was dry. I never told anyone. Didn't tell Fred. Uh, I didn't tell. When we took her home, I, di I, well, I did tell someone. I told her caregiver they should wash her clothes. Um, but it happened again. And it happened at IHOP. A different IHOP. But it happened at IHOP again. And this time I did tell them. This was, I think this was probably a month later, maybe two months later. And this time I did say, I'm sorry, my mother's had an accident on the seat. Can I? Can you maybe get me something to clean it up with? And the waitress was reading. I said, oh, don't worry, we'll deal, with, we'll deal with it. She took a look at my mother, and I think she figured it out. And she said, don't worry, we'll deal with it. I said, thank you so much, so much. And I left her a nice tip, and you know, we left. But I grew up because of what my mother's experience was. Um, and it was, I'm a different person now. I would never walk out of that restaurant. Just because of that reflection, I would never do that. I will address that situation, you know. If you're the guy who ever goes to a toilet and flushes the toilet and blocks it, there's a good chunk of us who just walk out of that toilet. And that was me until my mother's disease. I'm now the guy who goes, I'm sorry, I blocked your toilet. Do you have a plunger? I'm just the guy who does that, right? It makes you a lot braver. It may be, it, it increases your responsibility. It makes you approach things. I still have a long way to go. But that was the final gift my mother's given me. So far, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe there's other ones that she unconsciously, without knowing it, is gonna give me. There you go, there's my mother's story. One of my mother's story. If I think of others, I'll give you them. All right, have a nice day. Bye.